What's up, party people? It's Keys Dan with RadioWhat.com, DJLittleRock.com, coming to you live and in living color from the Radio What Studios. And this is my podcast, What Makes You Famous? It's an extension of the RadioWhat.com internet radio station that I've been running for quite some time. And if you need DJ services, where do I always send you? DJLittleRock.com. One more time. DJLittleRock.com. Check availability and get a free price quote, and maybe you can have me at your next event. You know I like to party with the people. The people need to be entertained. Are you not entertained? Let me entertain you. <laughs> you know, I've been booking a lot of weddings lately. Oh, my goodness. I, I know uh, over the holiday season, uh, people get engaged, and then uh, just around the first of the year, they go, uh, I think we need to plan a wedding. Well, I appreciate that you give old Keys Dan a call. I, I do enjoy uh, being with people at their best times in their lives. It's, it's the nice thing about being an entertainer is you get to be with people at the best times of their life. You, you get invited to those parties. Yeah, you're working, but you're, you're providing the entertainment. You're making the good feeling that they were going to have, that they were expecting to have. You make it even better. That's your opportunity as an entertainer to change their, their minds, change their feelings. They've been working hard all week, and they uh, spent Friday night or Saturday night going to this place that you're providing the entertainment for. And then you're changing their minds. They were feeling blue. And now they feel real good because of what you did. Speaking of entertainment and people that can do that kind of thing, today on the program I have Katrina Alexis. Oh, you've heard of Katrina Alexis. Oh, yeah, you have. Oh, you want to hear more about her? Ah, well, stick around. You'll hear more about Katrina Alexis in the next few minutes. Hey, this week's shows, I will be at the Rab in Conway, Arkansas, my regular Friday night gig the video dance party karaoke jam. Yeah, I said karaoke. You're the stars of the show on a Friday night at the Rab in Conway, Arkansas. They got a full bar, kitchens open, pool tables. They got a pool tournament on Friday nights. So if you want to try your hand playing pool and possibly make some money, I encourage you to check out the Rab in Conway, Arkansas. But you know, the stage is yours. I, I hardly ever sing at these karaoke shows. I know that there's karaoke jocks that'll go, uh, Oh, yeah, it's all about them, you know, and they'll have to at least sing at least one song every round. And if I sing one song in the night, it's because there was nobody singing, uh, you know, or, or it look, they look very timid. So I show them, look, you could sing horribly just like me. And still, you can get up here on stage. I got magic microphones. Everybody sounds pretty good. <laughs> That's the rab on Friday night, 8 p.m. until 1230 in the am. And then Saturday, you know, weddings, parties. All kinds of uh, birthdays, corporate events. Yeah, yeah. That's what I save my Saturdays for. I enjoy it so much. Thank you. All right, that's enough intro. Let's get into it with Katrina Alexis. Now, I got her on Skype, so if you're listening to the audio version of this, I encourage you to check out the video version on my YouTube page, youtube.com forward slash user forward slash keys Dan, and you'll see her beautiful face right there next to mine. <laughs> Skyping Katrina Alexis. Now. Okay. Yeah, I kind of saw behind the scenes. Uh, you know, your backdrop is very nice, but uh, I saw somebody come in that door right over there, right next to you. There was somebody come in. All right. You're not alone. Katrina Alexis, you have people around you. All right. Let's start over. Katrina Alexis, how was school? School was good. You know, first day back from winter break and you know last semester of my senior year so that's really really exciting oh do you rule the school as the senior i remember when i was uh when i was underclassmen i would get picked on you know uh i was always hefty so i get uh, uh, bru uh brutalized but then when i finally became a senior I, I would i would uh haze some of the the underclassmen you know rule the school as it were uh, but I, I figure you're you're a nice person, and, and and perusing your social media, I don't think you're the type that does that. But uh, maybe you can give the people an idea of who a Katrina Alexis is. Uh, really, I I would like to consider myself more of like someone who takes all the underclassmen under my wing, and you know, just kind of tells them that high school really isn't that scary. You just kind of got to get the gist of it. And, you know, a lot of these kids have been virtual learning for so so long now and so being back at school to them especially you know big scary high school 
is, you know, terrifying for them. But I, you know, I gathered a lot of them to be in my club that I created, a lot of the clubs that I'm president for. So I like to consider myself more of like a mama bear. Well, Katrina, Alexis, I mean, this might be the time capsule that people open up in 100 years. And you say remote learning. What? Uh, we just inject uh, a knowledge straight into our heads through this chip that we have here, you know, 100 years from now when they're, uh, uh, you know, learning, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, Google, what's that? It, that Google's already implanted in our heads. We know everything about everybody all the time, you know, but, <laughs> but tell me about remote learning as opposed to any other kind of learning. Remote learning was definitely difficult, you know, having to get the gist of it and, learning from your house and not in a school environment, especially as someone who needs that interaction one-on-one with the teacher and likes the energy of a classroom and other, you know, my st- classmates. It was definitely difficult, but I got through it. And, you know, thankfully my school opened up the next, the following year. And this year it's all been opened up and, you know, still difficult in person, but I would definitely don't want to go back to remote learning. So why, why was the remote learning? We still haven't gotten to the bottom of it for those people 100 years from now. Tell, tell me why you couldn't learn in a classroom like the people of today uh, you, uh, usually do. Oh, because, you know, we had a, a, a pretty big pandemic hit our country and we had all schools shut down and we weren't able to go to school and be with our friends. We had to learn from, you know, these things called laptops. I don't know if anyone knows what those are, um, but I had to learn from, oh, no, I don't know why that Uh-oh. calls. Hello? <laughs> there you go. All right. But go ahead. Can you, you had see to learn. me? Yeah, I see Oh, you. there you go. It's back you, to normal. Yeah, you had to learn from laptops and, and computers and such. Go ahead. I don't, I don't know what is happening. It keeps zooming out. <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. Some technical difficulties. Technology. It's great. No, but you, you're a young person. You've grown up with technology. You're smarter than the machine. You can handle all these things. I am kept saying error and everything. Okay, <laughs> I think we're back to good. Yeah, for the people that are listening to the audio version, they'll never know what just happened. <laughs> uh, the video version, you'll, you know, I encourage you to check out the video version on YouTube. <laughs> But if you're driving a car, hey, keep on the audio. It's a, you'll <laughs> you'll learn a lot about uh, Katrina Alexis and what's been going on in in her life at least over the last year. And then maybe we'll go a little further into the past about you know how how you became who you are. But uh, you know over the last year we've had to deal with this COVID nineteen, uh, a SARS CoV two, I guess is mm-hmm. what, uh, one of the names of it, and it's a. Uh, it's been going across the nation, but the, I believe that the young people, especially the people that are in school, you know, the little kids, uh, you know, five, ten, five, six, five to 10 years old, they're good. They're resilient. They're made of rubber. They got Wolverine powers. It's the yes. ones that are a little older, the preteens and even the teens and almost into adulthood that are really going into the, the dog years from ninth yes. grade to 12th grade. Oh my goodness. 10 year challenge. It's almost like a 30 year challenge from ninth grade until 12th grade. I imagine you about four years ago, four short years ago, you were a totally different person. Imagine the people that are going through that with a mask on, you know, it's definitely been crazy. I, I give, you know, big credits to people that, you know, from the eighth to ninth grade year, um, even your ninth and 10th grade year, you know, just that transition as a person, you're already having to grow a lot. And then plus all the circumstances that are happening outside of that. I bet, I mean, mine just got hit my sophomore and junior year, which, you know, you're trying to learn how to drive for the first time. You're taking your AP classes and it was, a, it was definitely an adjustment, but you know, we all got through it. And looking back now, I'm like remote learning. I don't even, I don't, I don't ever want to do that again. I don't know what that was. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I, you know, when I went to college, uh, you know, a bunch of, t- I've been to college a bunch of times, but the first time I went and I studied psychology, I, I figured, hey, maybe I'll be a psychologist. Maybe I'll be a, a doctor, of psych- a psychiatrist, you know, and, and, uh, and go that far, go the distance. I did not, but psychology taught me just enough to mess me up for the rest of my life. 
I study people. <laughs> I, I talk to people. I stay engaged with people. I like to have conversations from with people and learn from people. Today, I'm learning from you, Katrina. But one of those things is facial expressions, seeing mm -hmm. smiles, seeing frowns. I, I, I want to see faces. And if you have a whole year when you can't see somebody's face, that's got to be daunting, you know, a lot harder to, uh, to find, to figure out how people are feeling when you're talking to somebody, you're wearing a mask, they're wearing a mask. How was, how was that for you as a young person? You know, I think my generation, we all kind of struggled with facial expressions, even before the pandemic, you know, all of our lives are on social media. A lot of us, you know, text all the time anyways, my generation definitely has a difficult time picking up social cues and stuff like that. So I don't believe like, you know, wearing the mask was so difficult for us because we've already been struggling with that for the past, you know, six, seven years. You know, now we have kids as young as two years old on iPhones now, and I couldn't imagine how they're going to be in 10, 20 years. Yeah, I know text. You just mentioned text and Twitter and texting somebody, nobody makes phone calls anymore. It's all texting. It's all tweeting. Uh, if you, you know, you might send a, a Snapchat to them uh, if there's any kind of communication at all. Uh, sometimes we'll do the Skype thing or the Zoom calling. But the way to get around uh, having no emotions in a text, you came up with emoticons. You guys are geniuses. Mm -hmm. you, know, <laughs> I, you know, I I feel good today. And then a little happy face. Oh, that lets me know they do. They feel good today. Or I feel good today. Sad face. They were being sarcastic. Huh? <laughs> I get it. You know, so you, you, and I'm blaming you, Katrina Alexis. You, you invented emoticons. I said it. <laughs> I on would this be a podcast. millionaire if I did. <laughs> All right. No, I, I think I, I went ahead. I got ahead of myself. Um, usually in the beginning, I want you to give the blurb that you would have on your Wikipedia page. And I didn't see if you had a Wikipedia page or not, but the top paragraph or two, I want you to tell the people what would be in that Wikipedia page. Give the people an idea of who a Katrina Alexis is. So really, I would say that, hi, I'm Katrina Alexis. I'm an 18 year old singer songwriter from Florida. Uh, I have an album out called The Story of Us that's available on all platforms, such as Spotify and Apple Music. And I also have a website, KatrinaLexis.com, where you can find all my music videos for certain songs that I have made. Um, I am a high school student. I'm a senior. I have created a club at my school focusing around foster care system and works with an organization that works with foster care children. I'm the president of American Sign Language Club, which is a very big passion of mine. I would love to be a child psychiatrist in the future and hopefully attend a university somewhere in Florida. Oh, my goodness. All right. Now, the difference between you and an older person that I would have on this podcast is they would give a couple of lines. You are so used to uh, having to promote yourself on social media, having to put that website out there. You gave it all. Bing, 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 bing. All the, all the, the points that you needed to hit have been hit. You're used to this. You're used yes. to being out there, putting content out for people. It, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I grew up and then this came to me as I was growing up in 1986. Mm -hmm. I was the, uh, the sysop, the system operator of a board in Broward County, Florida, because you're making me homesick. You're making me homesick talking to somebody in, in Florida. I was born and raised in Miami, South Florida, the Florida Keys. I was born in Miami. Hey, oh, whippa. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm half Cuban, half Irish. We're, we're, what I'm you? Cuban. Hey, Marco Wallo de la Guantanamera. <laughs> Estamos aquí. Okay. No, uh, <laughs> el resto de este, uh, necesito practicar mi español. <laughs> I, 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 um, uh, ante, uh, traba, trabajé en un, una emisora radial que fue bilingüe, pero <laughs> mi español es de madre. No puedo hablar uh, muy mm -hmm. bien el, el español, pero para hablar okay. bilingüe está bien. You know, Aww. so yeah, in, uh, I worked at a bilingual radio station. It was uh, Exito 105.5. We played two English, two Spanish, two English, two Spanish, salsa, merengue, disco, mm -hmm. uh, freestyle. You know, it was all th that. And, and, and I spoke enough Spanish because I'm third generation. My grandma came from Cuba. My, my grandfather came from Cuba. 
mom mm-hmm. from New York, and me <laughs> born in Miami. So third generation, the blood gets thin. So I need to practice. Tell me about your Cubanness. Uh, are you from so, Cuba or born in uh, born in Miami though? So I was actually adopted. I'm um, originally from Hialeah, Florida. My mom and dad are both immigrants. My mom from the Philippines. She came when she was younger. And then my dad came from Cuba. Um, they adopted me from Hialeah. I have an older brother who is Cuban, Filipino, but he has autism. He's 25. And then when they adopted me, I kind of became why well, I'm a part of their family now. And my whole life has been spent promoting awareness for adoption, autism, and the foster care system because it's something that us as a family has strongly we've strongly felt about yeah i can tell by your youtube by your facebook anybody that peruses your your uh your social media knows that you are a member of the community you are a fine upstanding citizen you're already (laughs) becoming that uh, and that's fantastic Uh, i'm very excited to know someone like you young people the children are our future you know, and you yeah. are the children that are becoming the future and you're already reaching down to the underclassmen and helping them up. So be- because of your upbringing, because of your family mm-hmm. status and your situation, it, it, the things that you hold near and dear to your heart, your brother, uh, you know, the struggle, the, the challenges he goes through, that's in your in your peripheral and and the. Uh, well, I mean, you said you you get into the sign language as well, and you want to do psychology. I'm so glad that I took psychology because it was <laughs> helpful. It's helpful in, in my everyday life. It is. You wouldn't know. I'm a very shy guy. I, I'm 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 not good at talking to people. Oh, yeah, sure I am. Okay, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, no, I, I it really opened me up, and it really made me, mm-hmm. you know, have the ability to stay engaged with with someone in a conversation. You know, and, yeah. and yes, I'll, I'll probably go into tangents. I'm excited that you're from Miami. This is very exciting because here I am in central Arkansas. How did I get to <laughs> Arkansas? I'm from the Florida <laughs> Keys, baby. Keys Dan. That's where that name came from. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm still homesick. <laughs> Thank you, Katrina Alexis. No, but uh, uh, tell me about, you know, the the clubs that you're into. How did you get into that? Uh, you know, you can delve into any of the avenues that you're in. And I know looking at your at your YouTube, at least since 13 years old, you've been singing. We'll get to all that. So tell me about the avenues you want to explore. There's so much to unpack in the many uh, the many faces of Katrina Alexis. So a couple years back, um, well, I say a couple years, I'm 18 now. So, you know, I say about 10 years ago or eight or nine years ago. Uh, I found an organization that really hit my heart. It's called the Foster Closet, and it's an organization that helps kids in Northeast Florida in the foster care system. You know, they provide necessities that they need, clothing, tutoring, such as. And in high school, I really wanted to bring that to Bartram. I really wanted kids at Bartram Trail to see, you know, what was behind those doors, what was more out there in the world. And... I created a club, and in a year, we went from 12 to 85 members, which was really, really exciting. And a lot of kids that volunteered there, it opened their hearts. They heard these kids' stories. They heard these kids' backgrounds, you know, things that they had to go through in their everyday lives that they didn't even know that kids at, as young as seven years old had to go through. So that place really, I mean, brings tears to my eye, just, you know, seeing how much impact they have on our community now and so that was one club I'm the president and founder of. Then I have the ASO club. I've always been interested in American Sign Language. Growing up with a brother who has autism, I was always surrounded by it. So in high school, I decided, you know, take ASO one as a start, even though, you know, my parents wanted me to take Spanish, obviously, you know, me being Cuban and all. Um, but I fell in love with it. And, you know, my teacher was like, I know I can see that you have a passion for this. Uh, So she put me as president in training my junior year, and now here I am, now the president of it. So it's really, really fun. We have over 100 members in that club. And then I'm also the president of Wait, 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 stop stop there. How does ASL help with autism? Well, my brother is nonverbal. He can't speak. So growing up, we did basic signs to him, you know, I have to go to the bathroom or food or can we go for a drive, stuff like that. And for kids that are nonverbal, it's a huge opening. It's a huge way of communication. Um, and then my brother, his way of communicating is also through music. 
he's also the reason I started music in the first place. He loves it. I always grew up around the house listening to Disney songs on repeat. <laughs> so really, my brother has been my biggest inspiration for a majority of the things that I do in my life now. So, oh, man. Hey, tell, that, you're doing it for your bro, bro. What's your brother's name? His name's Lou. Lou. You're doing it for Lou. Oh, my goodness. I can tell Lou has been a big inspiration for a lot of the things in your life. Okay. Uh, the thing, the foster care, uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, I guess the, 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 the small things that I have with foster, my best buddy in the whole world. Uh, I've noticed him since 1982, John Canada. He adopted two girls, uh, two little girls, Aww. fostered them for, well, well, he fostered them for a long, 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 long time and started the adoption process shortly after that, which, took it feels like 10 years uh to, to it took yeah maybe five years but but it feels like it took forever to adopt mm -hmm. and then my little baby sister she's 23 years younger than me she's she was adopted because my Aww. uh my mom got remarried and you know they were trying to have kids and and she found they found this baby and my little sister heather you know she's wonderful she's a hairdresser in miami so if you're ever there uh ha hair uh was it ha hair by he or heather hmm Hair by Heather. Ooh, I didn't, oh, I'm bad. <laughs> Sorry, Heather Lee. I, I think uh, she, she's always watching these things. But, uh, uh, you know, she's a, a, beautician, a beautician down in, in Miami. I'm very proud of her. But, uh, you know, she was adopted. She was somebody that came. You know, we chose you. You were chosen. Yes. You know, you, you, you know, luck of the draw is when you, you actually birth a child. But when you go to an adoption agency, you got chosen. Katrina Alexis, you got chosen by this uh, uh, cu uh, Cuban uh, mother and Filipino father, or am I backwards? Switch. Okay. Backwards. All right. So Filipino mother, Cuban father, and yeah. uh, I could I could see you know the Filipino women are very beautiful. Yes, I could see that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, but um, you know I, um, they chose you. How old were you mm -hmm. when they when they uh, uh, were, you, were you fostered at first and then adopted or straight into yeah. adoption? Tell me about it. So I was very, very lucky. I was I came into their lives when I was three months, um, but I was born premature. I was born out of you know early, and so I spent some time in the hospital. And then the minute I got out of the hospital, though, my family was there with open arms. And the adoption process took a long time; took about two years. You know, for me, I always tell people I was just wanted that much. So many people wanted me at one time, and so um, I was officially adopted when I was two years old. But I've never known any other family than the one I have most now. And so I was very, very blessed. But I know it's kids out there that, you know, they haven't been as fortunate as I was. And so I just felt, I feel like more people need to know about that. And more people need to see that, you know, there are parts of the foster care system that are very, very broken. But there are also some parts that are gorgeous and they're beautiful. And they have the families with open and loving arms. Well, somewhere around this time in your life 16 17 18 years old uh, I know my little sister when she got to, to be that age she wanted to know uh, the family her biological family mm -hmm. and uh, we knew them you know they were shirt tail relatives kind of cousins of cousins of cousins and they live probably around you in the north uh, northwest Florida somewhere in that area but um, mm -hmm. you know I've seen them I, I've seen pictures of them her older sister looks just like her have you ever had the idea the thought to go find your biological parents or for me it's always been more to find my siblings because i was raised with a brother with autism i never got to have like the average you know bonding with your siblings that are both communicative and both verbal i mean we have our own way you know he still comes and throws pillows at me you know like normal siblings would uh but i've always been more interested in that um, you know, just seeing who else I had out there. My parents have always been super open with me about my own adoption. Um, I know a lot about both my birth parents. And so now that I'm at that age, you know, where I can kind of decide what I would want to do, uh, right now my life's really, really hectic. And, you know, a lot of times when you unpack that part of your life, it can be a very emotionally draining. So right now I'm just not really prepared for that. I'm in high school, senior year, it's exhausting <laughs> already. Uh, but eventually in the future, I would love to be able to, you know, see more of my siblings than more of my parents. I got you. I got you. I, I, that makes a lot of sense. I, I, ha I think I have a brother uh, named Billy Joe Gilson out there. Uh, my real last name is Gilson. But, I, you know, it, my uh, mom and dad got divorced when I was uh, probably a baby, you know, not even one, mm -hmm. you know, and he came around every once in a while. 
and I know that he started another family, and I know that I have a brother out there, but I've never met him. I, I mean, well, mm-hmm. I, if I've met him once, I haven't kept in touch with him. I, I see your point. I would like to reconnect with with that sibling, even though I do have a, a little brother that that I, I I keep in touch with quite a bit, and and, and I love him dearly. He's been on the podcast too. Yeah, so Aww. yeah, I, I, I've only had two. Wait, maybe three family members on the podcast that, you know, all the other ones are kind of kind of shying away from that. But but, you know, everybody's got a story. And Katrina, Alexis, mm-hmm. we're kind of delving into your story and why you are the way you are and and why you sing the songs that you sing and, and what makes you tick uh, as an individual. Uh, you know, I already know that you're great with technology. You got your, your earbuds <laughs> in. You sound great. You look great. You got your your backdrop. If you're watching the video version, uh, you know what's what's behind that backdrop. No, no, don't tell, <laughs> don't tell. It's like the Wizard of Oz. Don't don't pay attention to that person behind the curtain. Don't worry about that. Don't do it. <laughs> no, but uh, all right. So tell me about the in your in your school life. Uh, do you have mm-hmm. extracurriculars? All right, you you already said about the ASL. You said about the the different clubs. Are there any other clubs that you're uh, into? Yes, I'm also the president of an acapella club at my school. <laughs> at my school, <laughs> but I love it. You know, I love singing, and it's people that I'm in choir with, and we have a lot of fun. And this year, especially, we've been able to go out and perform more throughout you know our area. And it's been a lot of it's been a lot of fun. I mean, we're performing at a hockey game, a semi-professional hockey game next week. What's the name and of the so team? The Icemen. The Icemen. Yes. So that's super cool, and that's something really new for them. Uh, it's our kind of first year doing that, and you know, they all look at me like, "You do this all the time. Like this is like your normal life, and it is my normal life. My normal life is going out there and performing." It is my goodness, and, and acapella has been. I, I, I love. I, I like pentatonics. You know, and, I love them. Oh my goodness! You know how many? How many in your uh, in your acapella team? Are they broken up into little groups, or or is like a team of twenty five or thirty people up there singing? We actually keep our group quite small. I believe we have like eleven, twelve of us. Um, but I mean, everyone's voices are amazing and the way that we blend sounds really, really good. And this year we're doing competitions and we're challenging ourselves more, which I love to do. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I talked about, uh, pentatonics, they kept it down to, to five voices mm-hmm. of different, uh, you have to find those different voices that, that have their own flavors. Where, where would your voice, uh, lie? What's your, what's your range? So truly, we never really know what my range is because I can hit guy notes and then I can hit super, super high notes. I've had my teacher put me in tenor before because she needed someone to hit the the boy notes. And then I've been put anywhere as high as soprano one because I can sing that high if needed. But I like to stay around the alto section. I like to, you know, stay a little low and pop up high if I need to sometimes. I remember my little brother was in choir and he was he's six foot five now six foot four six foot five real tall but i remember he sprouted somewhere around eighth grade so he was the only bass in the choir of about 20 (laughs) people and when they sang this song and i remember it vividly uh chiquita banana i'm chiquita banana and i'm here to say and this is down in miami of course right they're singing a chiquita (laughs) banana song and uh Mm -hmm. i remember he had to hit the low notes and you could hear him chiquita banana chiquita Banana. All right. But I was watching some of the videos and, and thankfully you have your YouTube page. You put out that good content. I went all the way to the first video. You, when you were uh, a wee 13 years old oh my goodness. And, and I'm looking at you on stage, you got presence already. You were already up there shaking it, moving around, you know, working it. You were singing your song, but it wasn't just the singing. It was the showmanship that you give. You have that. Has that always been with you? Or are you the annoying little kid that's, that was singing in the corner to, to your parents and singing all over the house? Or, or you know, when, when did that start? So really all my life, I, you know, I did every extracurricular possible. I was putting a lot of sports and dance and all that. But one thing I had never tried was singing. And when I was seven years old, I actually decided to enter myself into a singing competition at my school. And I came home and told my parents and they looked at me and they were like, you've never sang. Like, we don't know if you can sing or not, which is crazy because when I was like a month and not a month, a year and a half old, there's a picture of me with a microphone in my hand, kind of like telling my parents already. 
Yeah. But when I was seven, they were like, okay, like we support you. Like we will do anything we need to do to help you. And then I ended up placing third and this competition was for, you know, adults and children. So that was, they were kind of like, oh, okay, you can do something. Yes. And then, um, what was the, the song director? Oh, what did I sing? What did I sing, mom? Oh, I love putting you on the spot. <laughs> I know. I like, and then I put my mom on the spot. That's right. That's right. She remembers. It was Castle on Castle on the Cloud by In Les Mis. <gasps> oh, how beautiful. So you have been growing up with Disney and, and, uh, and the show yes. tunes and the like uh, your whole life. I mean, did, when, when, uh, give me some of the, the Disney cartoons and, and some of the stuff that you would, uh, I, I remember on Sunday nights we had world of Disney and we always had a Disney movie, uh, on television. And I guess now that everything's on demand, you can watch Disney anytime, but, uh, tell me about yes. the, the cartoons that you had to watch over and over again. Move on, Ariel, Sleeping Beauty, Beauty and the Beast. I've watched almost every single Disney movie thousands of times, I would say. So I definitely grew up with that. And then my dad is a big Elvis Presley fan, like probably the biggest in the whole world. Elvis' he birthday, January 8th. I He's probably going to celebrate more, you know, more than my own birthday. Um, he uh, loves you you may man. or may not see it. When I went to Graceland, I stayed at the Heartbreak Hotel. I did too this past summer actually. It was my first time going to Graceland. You see that it says Lonely Street, Memphis, Tennessee, mm -hmm. room two two three. I told I told the lady, you know I'm gonna steal this key, right? She goes, Yeah, everybody does. Just leave your deposit. And I said, I'm gonna need another key for my grandma. <laughs> yeah. From what I understand, since uh since I think it was early two thousands when I stayed there, since then it burned down or or it had a, a fire, the Heartbreak Hotel, right across yes. the street from the Graceland. Mm -hmm. They had to rebuild it. Oh. I stayed there this past summer when I went for like a little trip to Nashville. Um, and my dad was like, we have to stop by. We have to stop by Graceland. It's the one thing I've always wanted to do with you. And I mean, my dad looked like a little boy in the toy aisle on Christmas Day when he walked in there. And he knew all the facts and he knew, you know, all of Elvis's wives and all the rooms, the jungle room, everything. And here's me who's just grown up like this. I was the youngest one on that tour. I was probably the youngest one in that place in general. Um, Cause you know, my generation, we don't, we don't really listen to Elvis Presley anymore. We get all of our inspiration from the singers that have gotten inspiration from him. Um, but I mean, it was an amazing place and it was really beautiful and it's really kept up with. Absolutely. I mean, it, when I went in 1999, uh, the tour was, I think it, it wasn't the one with the headphones yet. It was actually a person guiding you through and we were allowed to go upstairs to his bedroom. And yeah. I, I remember later on, we couldn't, Did, were you able to go mm -hmm. to the bedroom? No, we weren't allowed to go anywhere upstairs. Okay. Well, we we're allowed to, yeah, not his room at least. I think Lisa Marie is still staying there and she, uh, yeah, and, she and, stays there sometimes. Okay. She has a lot of stuff there, but 99, mm -hmm. when I first went, I was able to go up the stairs. They didn't let us in the room, but there's a mirror that lets you see into the famous bathroom where, uh, he met his oh. demise. Yeah. Yes. But no, I, you know, Graceland is, is my Graceland. You know, it's a, it's very spiritual and not just there, but sun records and stacks records, mm -hmm. uh, the, the different, uh, places, uh, even, you know, down the, down the streets, uh, the, there's different avenues of, that are musical, different cities that are musical, yes. Nashville and, and even in, in LA has its musical and, and New York and Chicago. Oh my goodness. The, mm -hmm. the, the musical, feelings and, and even beale street it, 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 and in uh what is it in new orleans uh oh yeah oh, you you get down to to bourbon street on new orleans and it just it's musical you have different mm -hmm. flavors but going to going to graceland i'm sure it was a, a jam for your dad and he wanted you to have that same feeling whether you have it or not that's what dads do i think i'd get along with your pops real good yeah. <laughs> my, my grandma is who turned me on to, to elvis she's the real Elvis fan. And then she turned me on to him and, and yes, I, I, I love him. I get his flavor. I, the gaudiness, what is it yeah. with those clothes? My goodness, but he's a showman and you're a showman. Yeah. You're a person that gets up there. You, when you get on stage, you dress up, you, you, yeah. you, you put it on, you, you, you want to have a new outfit. You don't want to get up there and, and, you know, old ratted up, you know, dirty clothes. You have the opportunity 
to shine. You're going to change people's attitudes with your music. Am I right? Am I wrong? No, 100%. I was always taught by my parents and, you know, my vocal coach, when you hit that stage, you have to look like you're worth a million bucks. You got to always look your best. Um, and I just always grew up like that. And I mean, I love hitting the stage. I love the energy that I get when I hit the stage, and especially when you look good, you just feel more confident in yourself. Honestly. I mean, I'm, I'm sure some people would love to get up on stage and just wear sweatpants and a sweatshirt, but you know, I would like to wear a jumpsuit or a dress or something that's really flashy for the audience to see. I've seen it. Uh, you know, I've seen it to where a singer gets to that certain level and they'll show up and maybe they're, they're not their best, but you can tell in the performance you can feel, mm-hmm. you can see it on their faces. You know, if they're not wearing a mask, you can see it on their faces that they're they're not having the best time because they're not in uniform. Whenever, whenever yeah. I'm performing for somebody, and I, I'm no, I, I'm no singer. I I sing some karaoke songs here and there, but mostly <laughs> I've been the DJ since 1986. I'm the guy that promotes wow. other singers, that promotes other artists. Oh, you have a song? Let me play that for you on the radio and see if I can get it to my audience you know, thousands, maybe hundreds mm-hmm. of thousands in Miami. Maybe it was millions. Maybe, you know, I was wow. on the morning show down there. So yeah. that, that's the power that I have is to help you get that much further. And that's my job. But, you know, when whenever I go to a show, whenever I'm doing a, even a karaoke show or, or doing a wedding, I, I put my little bow tie on. I put my, mm-hmm. my, my you know, I dress in, in my, my little tux when I'm doing a wedding. I put the, uh, the suspenders on. I put the, the vest on. You want to dress up, wear some, you know, you're, you're putting on a show for these people. They got out of their house. You know, they hired a babysitter yeah. and they came to see you, Katrina Alexis. That, that's the power you have. What, I mean, what are you going to give them when they come and see you? You know, you got to give them, I would say, got to give them your 100. You got to give them your best. Yeah. Cause you know, they're, they drove out there or, you know, they're there with their friends or their significant other, you know, whatever. And they're still, I mean, whether it's even like in a restaurant, they're still listening to you. They still want to hear quality music. They go to a restaurant to hear, you know, some sort of music, whether it be, you know, live music or radio music or something, but they still want to hear some, something that they enjoy. So obviously you don't want to, I mean, if you're sick, that's one thing, but you don't want to be giving them like no energy. You don't want to look like you're not, you don't want to be there. You want to look like you're happy to be there whether it's one person sitting there eating or a hundred people sitting there eating. You want to make every single person feel like they're special and that they're worth it. Well, tell me about a Katrina Alexis show. When they show up, they're going to see, of course, Katrina Alexis uh, dressed to the nines, looking good, got the hair, got the makeup, you know, uh, you know, just uh, walking tall. You got that. Before you even sang a note, uh, do you have a backup band? Is there a track? Are, are you doing live shows? Or is it all recording studios? There's different kinds of, of recording artists. You, you could be mm-hmm. the, the recording artist that sits and does recordings and puts out record after record, singles after singles, all day long, all, you know, all year, you know, year after year. Or you could be that live entertainment, performing at, at parties and weddings and, and bar mitzvahs. I haven't done a bar mitzvah mm-hmm. since I was in West Palm Beach. Hmm. I miss those. <laughs> Where are my Jews at, man? Where are my Jews? Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you go to a different party or do you perform live and doing shows or are you the studio or are you a little bit of both? So since, you know, what's crazy about me is I started as I performed all throughout Florida and I was out there performing everywhere. And then, you know, COVID hit and there was no more of that. There was no more performing outside. There was no performing at restaurants. And so I kind of took that as my chance well, let's do some recording then. I don't have anywhere to go. I mean, I'm stuck in my house. Might as well write songs when I can. So, I mean, I wrote my first song, Bonnie and Clyde, when I was actually 14 years old, when Irma hit Florida, like one big semi-truck, and there was no power, no electricity. And, you know, as a kid that lived in this generation where we're always on our phones or we're always watching TV, I took this chance to sit down and write my first song. And that opened a lot of avenues for me in the future. And, you know, I came out with Bonnie and Clyde during the beginning of COVID and I got some good feedback and I was like, okay, maybe I should continue songwriting. And even from, you know, my first song, Bonnie and Clyde to my last song that I've recorded, you know, anxiety from you, my songwriting has, you know, grown tremendously. My confidence while songwriting has grown tremendously. 
and my ability to put more emotions behind my songs, you know, because I have gone through, you know, some life experiences since little eighth grade me, um, you know, I'm able to put more emotion and write songs that I think my audience would be able to relate to more. Well, all right. Tell me the story of Bonnie and Clyde. I mean, everybody knows uh, a little bit about the, the, the Bonnie and, and Clyde of mm-hmm. the 20s, you know, the, the, the gangsters. So tell me about the song, because I think I've heard a Bonnie and Clyde song, but I, ha- I don't think I've heard your Bonnie and Clyde song. Uh, what made you sit down and write a song and was it named Bonnie and Clyde and you worked your way backwards or did you write mm-hmm. a song and then go, huh, I'm going to name this Bonnie and Clyde? So that's actually the part that I, I never remember. All I remember is, you know, Ermat hit no electricity. And I was like, well, let's start writing a song. So I began writing some lyrics and the lyrics that I were writing were just so like, you know, two people that loved each other, but were so bad for each other. And at the time I well, at the time, a couple of days previous to Irma, I was watching a history show that was the episode I was watching was based off Bonnie and Clyde. And I've always loved the story of Bonnie and Clyde. I mean, not the people that they were, but, you know, just the story of, you know, that they still loved each other till the very, very end. Was that and show was, was like, that show timeless? Yes. How did you know? No one's ever heard of it. I like that show. I like shows that that are based in history, even if they're loosely based in history. I'll, I'll watch Doctor Who. My favorite Doctor Who episode was the the um, uh, Vincent Van Gogh episode. I mean, I'm I'm bawling. I'm bawling. I'm crying. I'm crying. Oh, Vincent Van Gogh. Okay, but no, that uh, that Bonnie and Clyde it struck a chord with the timeless. It did. Great, great uh, show. I, I think it's. I hope it. I hope it comes back. That's another thing that I got really killed hope by it COVID. Does too. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, you know, I I know that a lot of a lot of things stopped, and and I'm glad that you were performing out live. I I know that you've done countless uh, national anthems that are uh, that I've yes. seen, you know, and that's that's an honor in itself is to sing. Your that your gives you a chance to sing in front of people, but not just that. You're singing something that you know is going to lift up most of those people that are in that crowd. They're gonna go. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, just the soaring of that. Even though we're the only national anthem in the world that mentions rockets and bombs, I don't know. <laughs> but the, it, we're a warlike country, you know. It, it, it happened. The, I I did hear a statistic uh, on that, and I know I'm going to take us on a side note. In the last 263 years that we've been a country, I think we've only been at peace for about 16 of them. You can Google yeah, it. Probably. You can Google it. You can Google it. I, I, are we at peace right now? Maybe. I think we pulled out. Anyway, but you you've been growing up as a you know a young person in this time, and I know it, it's going to be defined a little bit about COVID. But p- previous to that, you were performing for people. Was it all restaurants, or you have a little stage there in uh, in Florida, and you're part of Florida? So originally I started out when I was seven, I started at a church, my local church and the adult choir here. And I just fell in love with being able to sing in front of a lot of people. And then from there, I started singing around this little place called the Mudville Grill. And it's a little restaurant that allows, you know, new singers and new performers to, you know, just sing in front of people for the first time and be able to you know, get your little jitters out. And then hey, when where, I was where's, around, where's the Mudville Grill? I want to put it on the what makes you famous walking tour. Um, it is where is I like no, it's like near Beach Boulevard area in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, it's a really really nice place and has a lot of history behind it. And it's just they have like a little room just dedicated for music. It's called the Music Room, and they always have shows there. So you know. You live anywhere near Jacksonville, Florida, you need some place to sing. The Mudville Grill is the place to go to. Always good to give credit where credit is due. Give little shout yeah. outs to the people that have helped you along the way. All right, Katrina Alexis, you, you get out of the Mudville Grill, you're feeling good. How many people are sitting in front of you? 50, 100, uh, two? Uh, you know, it's sometimes, it, hey, sometimes I perform for two people. I don't care. I, yeah. I, I, I'll do it. I, I've done it for two, and I've done it for 70,000. So yeah. it's you know, either way, you're going to give them that good show. You're still giving them that same energy. Well, maybe for the two, you kind of tone it down a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, tell, tell me about your, you know, Mudville Grill, or are you mm-hmm. singing your own songs, or you're singing covers? I was singing covers there for of? a little while. Who's covers? I sang, I mean, I sang covers from 
well, for the longest time, I was a country artist. Um, I sang a lot of Carrie Underwood. <laughs> I was like my go-to girl um, because I really didn't know where I landed yet on the spectrum of music. You know, I was raised in Jacksonville, which is predominantly country. But then I have a background of, you know, Hispanic and then I have a background of black and I have the background of, you know, soul and R&B. So I didn't really know where I fell because my voice could hit so many different places. And then I was raised in a pop era. I was the only thing I ever listened to on the radio. So I had a struggle, you know, kind of figuring out what I wanted to be. I had people telling me what genre I should do. And I never knew exactly where I wanted to fall. Um, but the Mudville Grill, I could sing a variety of different genres and a variety of different songs. And we had people, you know, we had Linda Davis. She's come down a couple of times to the Mudville Grill and I've met her and she's coached me sometimes. Wonderful lady, beautiful lady. Um, and even just that, like she told me, you have a range. You have a range of choices in that voice. And, you know, I have people telling me, you know, you should do this, you should do that. But for me, why can't I just do them all? Why can't I just hit a little bit of every genre if I could? Yeah, the the record companies and and people people in general want to put you in a little box. Uh, you know, be like Carrie Underwood, be like Taylor Swift, mm-hmm. uh, be like Shania Twain. You know, and the, and the people and Faith Hill and the people that came before. You know, to where you can break out. You know, I could sing this, I could sing that. Don't don't be like uh, what is it? Oh, uh, was it Garth Brooks when he did Chris Gaines? Oh, <laughs> don't completely change your whole persona. And I, uh, what is, is it, doesn't Beyonce have a different, uh, persona as well? I thought she, she, she's done a lot of this business. I mean, from dream girls to, you know, single ladies to lemonade, she's had her own fair share of different types of absolutely music that she's hit. Oh yeah. But you know, don't, don't limit yourself. My goodness. Mm-hmm. And I'm listening to, all right, I don't usually do a lot of research when I'm doing these things, but for you, I mean, your content is right out there. It, you, you're, you're putting yourself out to the world, and that's got to be, uh, my goodness, that's daunting in itself and to to put yes. your you put your heart out there and you say, please, do you like it? Is it, is it okay? <laughs> are you are you good with what I'm doing? Well, I'm good with what you're Aaron. doing. You have that sultry voice. You. you have the voice of someone who came. Uh, Nina Simone, uh, you know, the, the, the voices that came years before, uh, uh, the, oh my goodness, uh, Mahalia Jackson, the, the oh. really sultry, you could be a lounge singer, you could be a pop singer, you could be a country mm-hmm. singer, your voice, it, it mixes well with all of those genres and you, and they all inevitably become Katrina Alexis, whatever it is, that brand it becomes you, whatever you're singing, make it your own. Mm-hmm. And, and, but yeah, I, I do encourage you not to limit yourself, but you started with Carrie Underwood and, and you were singing that kind of stuff. But, uh, tell me about the, the gospel singing is church had been a part of your life, uh, when you were young or is it still going on? Mm-hmm. No church has been, has been a big part of my life. I went to a private school for a majority of my life. Me too. Um. St. Monica, St. <laughs> Monica rules. <laughs> Go ahead. But, uh, I went to a private school for a majority of my life. And, you know, we were going to church on Wednesdays and Sundays. And my dad, I mean, again, he loves Elvis Presley gospel, um, but has an album on vinyl and everything. And um, one of his favorite songs to listen to is How Great Thou Art. I believe it's a really beautiful song. And so I learned it. And, I mean, people told me, like, if there are certain songs in history that you you don't touch unless you can you can really, you know, nail it. Whitney Houston, another one. Wait, wait, Don't wait. Any... When you sang How Great Thou Art to your dad. Yes. Mm-hmm. He didn't like to admit it, but there were some tears. There were. He's there a were tough guy. Tears. He's a tough guy. <laughs> I'm cool. Macuano. Oh, mono. Huh? Macho. <laughs> no, I, 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 we're taught from very young, especially growing up at a certain time. I'm born in 69, and I'm guessing your dad's around the same age. You know, and they teach us, especially in, in Miami, you got to be tough, you got to be strong, you got to be mm-hmm. ma- macho, man, you know. But then, you know, there's always a soft side. And if your daughter is singing How Great Thou Art to you, oh, I'm sure you hit them hard. You hit them in the feels. <laughs> oh. Okay, so continued. Whitney Houston, where are you at? Oh, yeah, so there's just some songs that you just don't touch. And so I was always so scared to, like, do that. You know, people would compare me to Whitney Houston sometimes. And for me, I was like, 
no, never compare me to her. I'm terrified of ever being compared to her. <laughs> please don't. Jennifer Hudson, don't compare me to her, please. I, they are musical geniuses oh, in my mind. They're people that I idolize. Oh. So it was very scary for me to even like begin to touch those, but that was where my voice was going, was more songs, you know, like that, powerhouse songs that would knock an audience out. And so I've been fortunate enough and I've been blessed with amazing coaching and my parents have supported me all throughout it to give me the best that I possibly could be. And, you know, every, with every song and every day I'm still growing as a singer, I'm, you know, I'm never going to be my best, you know, there's always something to work with, always something to practice. But, you know, sometimes I get up on that stage and I give a performance. And as long as I feel like I gave my best at that time, that's what matters. Oh, man. Okay. Now, after uh, Katrina Alexis' show, uh, what, what you know, do you just run off the stage? Thank you. We love you. Out. Or are, are, are you able to go and meet up with your, your fans, meet up the people that you were just singing to? Is there a little merch table? Can they buy the CD, the T-shirt, the hat, the button? I got to represent. <laughs> oh, I love the way that girl sang. Now I want to wear the cap while I'm listening <laughs> no, to the CD. Every, I always, you know, I always try to interact with as many people as I possibly can. And then I have my momager. That's what I like to call her. My mom manager. Um, she runs the little merch table that we have with Katrina Alexis shirts, which you can also find on my website, Katrina And <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm a social person. I love talking to people. And, you know, everyone's like, does it get old after a while? You know, people saying that you're so good. And, and for me, it's, it's not even that it gets old. I'm blessed to have people tell me that. I feel, you know, so thankful that I was able to have a talent like this. Yeah, to be able if, to share my message and my news with people. Look, if you're an American Idol and Simon says, I, I don't want to hear you sing ever again, it, it, you're going to go, all right, I'll go work at the post office or something. Cause that's it. You know, he, he gave me the truth, but if people keep saying that they love you and we want you back and all that, that means you can keep doing this. You know, every year I think, am I getting too old to DJ? And then I go DJ at a prom or a sweet 16 party. And I did. Okay. Uh, you know, they, they loved every song and they were like, you were mm -hmm. awesome. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll keep doing it. You know, Gotta keep doing what you're good at. You keep doing what you like doing. You know, you, you got mm -hmm. your you get your day job if you have to uh, for your insurance. You know, the the thing that <laughs> that you know it's nine to five. You, you do it because you have to. Maybe you kind of mm -hmm. like it. Maybe you maybe you become a psychiatrist by day, singer at night. Fantastic. That's the plan. That is the plan. <laughs> that what an incredible plan. You know, over the years I've been a firefighter. That, you know, when I, you were talking about you had a little uh, picture of you with a microphone. When I was a little kid, one of the most famous pictures of my, in my household is me with a firefighting hat. And, I, and then I did that in the Florida Keys from, from 89 to 99. So 10 years I was a firefighter. So it, wow. it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's uh, it, they saw the future. When they, they mm -hmm. saw the microphone in your hands, they saw the future. That something's going to happen with this kid. She's special. We need to choose her and get into this family. You know, and, and, and that's, <laughs> you know, that's the way it started. They chose you because they knew you were special. And, and oh. not just for, for them, because, you know, your mom and dad, they're always going to love you. They, you know, that's their job. They got to love you. They put the roof over your head and, 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 and the food on your plate. But then, yes. then you go out into the world and you sing your song and the people love you as well. That's got to give you the energy. What do, you, what, what do you get from that? No, especially when I had released my album, The Story of Us, the amount of feedback that I got, because I have a multitude of songs on there that range different emotions, different sounding. You know, I have some, I have a rock song, but I have, you know, more summer pop songs. And then a lot of my songs I put my heart into, I put my story into. And so just to have people come up to me and tell me like, I really related to this song. I loved this song. Or, you know, I just got my heart broken and I jam to this song every day. Or I'm in a relationship and this is exactly how my relationship is and I love it. You know, for me, I did something correct. And then especially since I want to be a child psychiatrist, I wrote a song called Stop, which just focuses on mental health and the struggle that, you know, someone with mental health lives through on a daily basis. And the amount of people that that touched, you know, opened my heart up. I was like, I can do this. I really want to help people like this. You know, I did watch the video for Stop. 
tell me about the making of that video. I'm a very visual person. Uh, you know, I, whenever I do uh, parties, and I will play this song on Friday night at the Rab in Conway, Arkansas. I will play this, <laughs> and I'll put the video up on the screen, and people are going to go, huh, who is that? It sounds pretty good. Oh, that's Katrina Alexis. Look her up. You know, that's my job is to is to put you out into the club, onto the radio. But tell me about the making of that video <laughs> and the recording of that song. Uh, what was the what was the whole thing? Where did you go to record it? And then who made that video? So I go to a recording studio called Rockbot Studios. He's an amazing producer, and I love the way that you know I wasn't able to play many instruments back then. I can barely, you know, I could play some chords on the piano, but I would just tell him exactly how I wanted the sound to sound like, or you know, people similar, artists similar sounding to it, and he just knew exactly what I meant. And I mean, I love a producer that can do that, you know, especially as someone who can't play many musical instruments. I'm not going in there with a backtrack already made or like a scratch. I mean, he, I tell him, you know, I want something that something that hits someone's heart really hard, someone that struggles with mental health. And, you know, I have like maybe a verse or two down that I can kind of sing to him. And I mean, he, I just his creative side, you know, like a light bulb, like a light, it turns on. And so stop. I really wanted a music video that showed, you know, the different disorders that people go through, you know, as mental health is constantly, you know, getting pushed into the spotlight now, finally, that it is really important. So, you know, I decided to have some kids from my school do it. You know, we're all teenagers, you know, we've all at one point gone through something or we will go through something and we will have these feelings and that it's okay to talk about them. And so, I mean, a lot of my friends wanted to do it. A lot of the underclassmen wanted to help do it. And so, you know, my school was in their great school. They were like, yes, please, please use this facility, you know, for an amazing message like that. And I mean, even sometimes, you know, the reaction that I got from stuff, I had people telling me that they would, you know, cry to that at night sometimes. And, you know, knowing that is knowing that I did my job correctly. I got that message across. It's not a simple song. There is actual a stop where most of the music just drops out. And it's all yeah. you that you, and you you're carrying that breakdown all by yourself. Pretty much that it shows the quality of your singing talent. And, and it's, it's not just, I mean, it is a wonderful song. It's got great content and the video, you know, all these kids, you know, they're showing the different types of, uh, of mental disorders or, or, you know, people to go through. And I wonder, mm-hmm. I wondered if any of those kids were going through those particular struggles, you know, and Mm -hmm. they, you know, maybe they told you, maybe they didn't, you don't have to ever name them, but did, you know, when they were going through it, it's because a lot of kids go through a lot of things, man. We all, we all, even us old farts, we all grew up. We were all your age once. And when your mom says I went through that, she did. She went through that. She went through exactly what you're going through unless you become a, you know, unless you're becoming a vampire or teen wolf or whatever you see in the movies, you know, she went through exactly what you went through. So take her advice. And I encourage anybody that's listening, any, any of the kids that are listening, take your mama's advice, man. You know, they, they've been around the block a little bit. They're, they're trying their best to raise you. No. And you know, my parents always tell me, you know, even back then, you know, that y'all's generation, you know, you struggle with your own mental health and your own certain ways. I mean, nowadays, you know, all of our insecurities are put on social media. You know, we're constantly criticized about what we post, what we look like. You know, if you don't have the perfect filter on your picture, if you filter too much of your photo or, you know, why do you look like this in real life? But then this on social media, you know, social media, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing way to communicate with people all around the world, has amazing avenues, but they're are parts of it where I, I can't stand, you know, the constant judgment that people get or the constant, you know, criticism is ridiculous, but then, you know, do the pros outweigh the cons, you know, but that's just one thing that my generation that we all go through now, you know, you see a girl on Instagram or you see a boy on Instagram and, you know, they look perfect. They look like they have the perfect life, Mm -hmm. but you know, you never really truly know someone until you're stepped into their shoes. You never know what's happening behind closed doors. You never know what's happening in someone's mind. You know, social media doesn't make you perfect. Yeah. One of the things that I, I, I learned over the years is um, if you had the ability to trade uh, problems with someone else, you would take your problems back more often than not. Yeah. Because they're going through just 
if not the same struggles, similar struggles, maybe even tougher, yeah. you know, and, and you're fortunate, you, you know, you got parents that love you. A lot of kids don't have that. Uh, there's <laughs> technology is great. There we go. <laughs> okay. But, uh, you know, you're fortunate that you have parents that love you. And I appreciate that, that you've spent some time chit chatting with me and talking to me about, about your life and about what, what's been happening. What's on, what's on the horizon. You have a, a new record and you got different kinds of songs, something for everybody on your album. Uh, you know, yeah. if, Oh, I, I don't like rock music. Oh, it's got a pop song and we got a country <laughs> song and we got a, like a rhythm and blues song and we got all this. And, and, and I expect, and I want for you to be able to go and do all those genres. Now, every song on that record, did you write it, write all those songs or do you have a hand in writing all those songs? I wrote all my songs. I have two cover songs on the album. My two favorite cover songs to sing, I'm Changing and House of the Rising Sun. But all other songs come from me, come from my notes and my you know, iPhone. Um, I mean, I loved writing all my songs. There were some songs that I wrote, you know, 10 minutes before the recording studio. You know, I had a song in mind that I wanted. And then I was like, no, 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 I need to change this. And I rewrote a whole song. And that was actually my rock song called Lie. Um, and I really liked the way that turned out. And then... I came home from my adventure during summer. I was in a camp up in New York and I met this amazing guy down there. I mean, up there and I came home and wrote a song about him. You know, so many parts of my life have been written to my songs. So I like to tell people that all my songs that I've written, I've gone through. I've, it's my personal, you know, words. And, you know, if you like them, you like them. If you don't like them, then I'm, I'm sorry that you don't like them. <laughs> no, that's your superpower. You can get all your life experiences, even at this young age. My goodness, you're only 18 years old. To me, you're a little baby. You're a whippersnapper. Young, you know, youngin. You're so far ahead of the game. You've been doing this since you were even smaller. You're so far ahead of everyone, uh, you know, of me for sure. As I, you know, I didn't start till... I was in my, you know, in high school, I started DJing, but, uh, you know, you, you're so far ahead of the game and I, I see nothing but big things coming to you on the horizon. I don't want this to be the last time that we chat. I want to be able to come back. You, uh, come back as things progress. If you got shows to promote, come back. We could talk for yeah, 20 minutes, half hour, whatever. This is just, just a kind of a, a getting to know you type podcast. This one was, but, um, you know, uh, I want you to give shout outs to people that have helped you along the way. Uh, you already mentioned a few people, but if you want to re-mention them, uh, give a, a laundry list. And just mind you, if you forget anybody, they're going to be mad at you for the rest of your mm -hmm. life. Oh, mm -hmm. no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, I just really want to thank, you know, both my parents, my mom and dad for always being supportive. I know that there's some kids out there that you know, they have a dream and, you know, their parents don't back them up on it. And it makes it 10 times harder. So obviously, you know, them, my brother, who is my biggest inspiration and my best friend in my life, Lou, um, my, Lou! <laughs> my, vo my voice teacher, Miss Chris Rowe, who's, you know, brought me such a long way. She's had me for about six, seven years now, and I would not be the singer I am today without her. Um, Rockbox Studios for producing all my songs, um, except Bonnie and Clyde, which was produced by Dexter Redding. That was really cool. And, um... Bird Flower Productions, who do does my music videos, uh, great guy, really, you know, the quality of the videos are very, very good. And then I have the local, you know, kind of our local music promoter here, who's, her name's Miss Juanita, and she does it all for free, and she does it for the kids, who was able to put me in the Mudville Grill in the first place, and who was able to circulate my music throughout town and put me in shows throughout the town. You know, without her, I wouldn't have gotten into half the places I've gone into, and then, you know, just like the bigger places for letting me sing there in the first place, Vice Star Veterans Memorial Arena for letting me sing there, the Daily's Amphitheater for letting me sing there, TPC for letting me sing there, you know, all those places that let me grow as a singer and grow as the person I am today. And then I want to thank uh, Jill and TJ uh, for putting yes, us together. Yes, and Nashville Entertainment Weekly, you know, couldn't have done all this without them, you know, meeting people like you and great people, you know, that helped promote my music even more that's our job once you get to a certain level uh, then it's time to pick up the next people you know you don't um don't ever look down on anyone unless you're reaching down to pick them up and put them you know on a bigger on a higher level 
you know, but don't, don't put them so high that they can't breathe, but, uh, you know, get them to the, <laughs> get them to the next level. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I hope you get some traction out of this and, and I, I hope for nothing but the yeah. best for you in the future. Now, I usually like to finish these things off with last words for the people. So I want this to be, you know, words to live by. Maybe somebody told you a long time ago, maybe a, a mantra that you wake up with every morning, uh, you know, or just whatever pops into your head at this moment in time. Katrina Alexis, give the last words for the people. I guess I have two last words. One, balance is a key to life. You know, you may feel like some days you can't do it, but I promise you, you can. And to always be yourself no matter what, you know, especially with the world that we're in today, you never know what's happening. You never know what's behind that next door. You never know what's behind that next hurdle. Always be yourself though, no matter what. And last but not least, I have a competition called Southside Idol in Florida on January 15th. And any prayers or blessings would be very much appreciated for that. <laughs> but um, yeah, those are my last words. <laughs> Well, there you have it, party people. What a nice young lady. A nice girl. Oh, my goodness. And not just nice, but also a fine, upstanding member of the community. Gets involved. That's something that, that uh, I know that I did when I was in high school and, and in college. Was they, they made sure that you went out into the community and, you know, pick up trash. You know, meet some people. Feed the homeless. Uh, I know I was a hugger for the Special Olympics uh, when I was in high school and in college, and that, that made me feel so good. And then uh, Relay for Life, I provided music for them as well. And just uh, giving a, awareness to, to whatever cause, you know, really strikes you, uh, it, it just really hits your heart hard, or just hits your heart somewhat. Go get involved. I know uh, in my family, there's, there's cancer. So I got involved with the Relay for Life. I haven't had any, uh, and thankfully, there, there haven't been any uh, uh, people that have gone into the Special Olympics. But being a hugger for the Special Olympics, oh, my goodness, the feelings that you get. And the, uh, oh, just, and I know she's involved with the, uh, the foster kids. These are kids that need homes, you know. Uh, yeah, group home. May sound like fun. Oh, yeah, you get to be with a bunch of kids. It can't be all that. Uh, it can't be all that it's cracked up to be. It's got to be more like little, little orphan Annie than uh, than anything else, <laughs> you know. So uh, people that have the the ability to foster children, and I know, I know something about you. You get a little bit of a stipend uh, for fostering, but <laughs> my uh, my best buddy when he fostered a child, you know, he, he was getting a little bit of a stipend, but then he came up with this silly idea to adopt them no money <laughs> they got they get no money now <laughs> so I, I guess losing that income was worth it to have the ability to say i i have two children now two beautiful girls that was fantastic and then my mom you know adopting my sister and i have a, a wonderful sister because of adoption that yeah yeah that's beautiful and I didn't know that about American Sign Language, that you could use that, of course, nonverbal. If you're on that part of the spectrum in autism and you're nonverbal, maybe sign language isn't for you. I know I, I dabbled in sign language. I learned ABCs and thank you and girl and man. and oh, I, I've, I've forgotten all of it, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, at least I do. I thank you. And I thank you, Katrina Alexis for being on the program, the What Makes You Famous podcast. I appreciate you so much, and I, I want nothing but the best. Uh, the, the psychologist by day, the singer by night. If that's what you want to do, do it. Oh, my goodness. Well, what a pleasure to talk to. Thank you. Thank you again. All right. Now, if you, if you would like to tell your story, I encourage you to give me a call, 501-470-6386, or email in, uh, keysdan at RadioWhat.com. That's it for this edition of What Makes You Famous. It's Keys Dan, RadioWhat.com, DJLittleRock.com. Peace. I'm out of here.